Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Alcina and I'm the Chief Executive of National Older People's Charity Independent Age uh, and we are a proud partner of ILC. I'm delighted to be chairing this afternoon's session entitled Who Cares? Fixing Social Care for Today and Tomorrow's Old. And this is of course a timely debate as 2020 has been a tough year as societies around the world have faced the grave challenge of a global pandemic leading to thousands of deaths, both directly and indirectly caused by COVID-19. Those of us with social care needs have been particularly cruelly impacted. One consequence of COVID-19 has been that our social care system has finally come into the political media and public spotlight thanks to almost daily headlines and news bulletins. There appears to be a greater appreciation of a vital, highly skilled professional care workers, yet attention has too often been focused only on care homes, leaving domiciliary care still lacking the attention and support it deserves. What is so starkly highlighted was that despite statements from our politicians that a protective ring has been placed around care homes, the problems the sector had getting tests, PPE, the medical support they needed proved that this was not the case and in fact resulted in thousands of deaths and exposed the stark lack of parity with the NHS and a care system that really does not work effectively for those of us who need it either, today's older people or also importantly for working age adults. Surely therefore the platform is burning hotly enough for social reform to finally happen, yet the spending review showed little signs of this. So where do we go from here? Well, this is the topic for this afternoon's session. We have two excellent speakers who need little introductions, Andrew Dilnut, who will share his thoughts on where we are with social care today, nine years on from the Dilnut Commission, and James Bullion, President of ADAS, who will share his reflections on the, the uh, on the what happens post COVID-19 and the spotlight it has shone on our care crisis. But before I introduce our first speaker, please can I ask you to complete our poll for the session. You can find it on the right of our screen. Um, the question we're asking is, are you more or less confident than a year ago that the government has a plan to address the care crisis? Be fascinating to see the results. Also, please do use the Q&A function to post questions. Um, I won't be able to pick up any questions that are posed through the chat. I don't have access to that um, as we're in a, in a little Zoom bubble, all of our own here. So please do post them again, looking at the right hand side of your screen there, you can see the Q&A uh, function so that I can then ask the panel following their presentations. So. Without further delay, I am delighted to ask Sir Andrew Dilnett, our first speaker, to address us. Sir Andrew, who is currently Warden of Nuffield College, Oxford, and Chair of the Geospatial Commission, needs little introduction. And he will be sharing his views on nine years on from the Dilnett Commission and where we are with social care today. Over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Deborah. It's lovely to, uh, to be here. I'm, I'm really delighted this is going on. Very quick, let me summarise very, very quickly what I'm, I'm going to say. First of all, there's a huge amount to celebrate in social care, that the fantastic work that is done by the providers, by this wonderful workforce who, in pretty tricky circumstances, in almost every case, do a wonderful job showing great skill and also great care and affection. It also, of course, reflects the fact that, that we're living longer. There are many more people needing care as a result of the fantastic increase in longevity over the last 150 years. So these are things that we should celebrate. So, so there's, there's a lot to celebrate. We haven't spent anything like enough money on social care. Uh, there has been significant, persistent underfunding. And that, combined with the way that social care is structured, what the probability of any of us needing it is, has led to a sector which entered the COVID crisis under enormous pressure already and therefore was not able to withstand it as well as it should have been. 
And then finally, social care is not something that we can leave to individuals to tackle on their own. It is a classic example of something where we have to do this together as a community. Uh, if we don't do it together, then it simply can't work. And that's what we've seen for far too long. This has to be something where we act to look after one another together because most of us won't need very much social care. This is not something where we can say, oh, everybody should plan for it, it's obvious what's coming. It simply isn't. Uh, only a small number of people will need very significant social care for a long period, but those are precisely the people that we need to be able to protect. So that, that's roughly what I'm going to say, but let me go through it in a bit more detail. Start with, with the fact that we're, uh, we have something we should celebrate, we're living longer. So I have a wonderful colleague, uh, I'll see you've got the slides. Could we go to the first, the first substantive slide? So this is a slide that shows the proportion of the cohort that was my grandparents uh, who lived to certain ages. You can see that uh, at the beginning of the last century, almost 20% of people died before they reached the age of five. So we lost a huge number of babies and young children. And then there were, the line is not flat beyond there. People went on dying and then death accelerates as we get to older ages. So if you look at uh, the age of 85, by 85, there are only 20% of the cohort left. If we, if we go on to the next slide, we can see what happened by the time of my parents' generation. So my mum is 85 now and 40% of her cohort are still alive. So a doubling in the number of people of the age of 85 and over in the previous year. Now, if we can go on through the next slides all the way to the final, the, the final slide of this pack, wonderful. So you can see this improvement in, in life spans has continued. And not only have we seen a big reduction in the number of infant deaths, but we've seen the line flattening thereafter. So there's much less death in normal adult age. So now the cohort that was born in 2005 we're expecting very nearly 80% of them still to be alive when they get to the age of 85. This is fantastic. But it does, of course, mean that there are many more people who are potentially going to need care. On top of that uh, increase in numbers, if we can go on to the next slide, alongside that uh, has come an increase in the proportion of this older population that have multiple health conditions to struggle with. So if you look, this chart shows back in 2000, 2001, nearly 60% of those aged 70 and over didn't have any long-term conditions that we'd identified. By 2017, 18, that was down to 35% having no identified health conditions and quite a large part of that group having multiple long-term health conditions that meant that they were going to be in need. In the face of all of this, what's been happening to public spending? If we look at the next slide, we can see what's been happening to public spending. And the answer is that it has not kept up. It hasn't kept up in aggregate. Uh, so if we look just at overall spending from 2010, 11, 2018, 19, we see that the real level is lower, but it, that, that's the red line. But if we look at the pale blue line, which adjusts for the number of people in the population, and then the purple line at the bottom, which is just not just for the numbers of people, but their ages, we see that we are significantly below even the levels of spending that we saw in 2010-11. So it's no surprise that the system is under enormous pressure. We simply haven't spent enough. Now, obviously, in a, in a good, caring society, we would have adequate social care spending to look after those who don't have the resources to look after themselves. So the means tested system that looks after those who can't look after themselves clearly needs more funding and needs that funding now. But on top of that challenge, there's a challenge of whether we should do anything for the rest of the population, the population that doesn't automatically fall into the means tested system. And I'm going to argue very strongly that the answer to that is that we should. And we understand that once we understand what kind of risk we all face in social care. If we go on to the next slide, what this slide shows is, imagine that we line the whole of the age 65 population up in order, starting on the left with the people who are going to need the least social care before they die, and on the right with the people who are going to need the most social care before they die. About 
bit less than a quarter of us won't need any social care at all. We'll be walking up Snowden at the age of 95, fully fit, heart attack, it's all over, we'll never need any social care. Three quarters of us will need some social care uh, on the basis of the current data. But what we don't know is how much. The, the, the person in the middle won't need very much social care, maybe the equivalent of six months in a residential care home, a year or 18 months of domiciliary care at a not terribly high intensity. But a smallish number will need a very, very large amount of social care, either a very lengthy period with high intensity needs in domiciliary care or many years in residential care. We don't know, we none of us know where we're going to end up on that curve. And that's the critical issue when thinking about social care. This is a classic example of something where what we need to do is what the economists would call pool risks. Because we don't know whether we're going to be the lucky person who dies climbing Snowden at the age of 95, or the less lucky person, but still capable of having a really good quality of life, but who is going to need support in social care facility, either residential or domiciliary, we need to spread the risks. We need to share them out. And what the next slide shows is what that would mean. Um, risk pooling, or we might call it insurance, spreads the risk. So everybody has to pay a certain amount, but nobody risks being in the position of losing everything. And this is the way in which we deal with most risks that have this shape. So we don't say to people, oh, you must make sure you've got enough savings in case your house burns down. You know, put aside as savings the total value of your house just in case it burns down. We don't say to somebody before they step into a car, you must make sure you've got enough savings so that if you are unlucky enough to have a car crash, you're covered there. We don't say to people, make sure you've got enough savings so that if you have a complicated and really difficult acute health care need, you'll be able to pay for it. We pool those risks. The first two we pool through private insurance. The, the, the third health we pool through social insurance. What, why haven't we got a solution like that for social care? Well, the first, the first response would be to say, well, let's turn this over to the private sector and let them provide private insurance. Why doesn't that happen? Well, the reason that doesn't happen is it can't and won't. If we go to the next slide, I'll try to explain why. We know roughly the shape of the green curve at the moment. We know what that looks like for the population that's currently receiving and needing care. The trouble is we've got no idea what shape that curve will have in 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years time. And if you're a private sector insurer, that's what you need to know before you could possibly uh, provide private sector insurance for this. So nowhere in the world is there private sector insurance for this catastrophic risk. And the technical reason is what's called the aggregate shock risk. So we know what the green curve looks like at the moment, but it's possible that in 10, 20, 30 or 40 years, it could look like the, the red or the maroon line. And if it does, and you've written insurance, then you go bankrupt. And that's why there isn't a private sector insurance market here. And there can't be. This is a classic example of an area where only the state can provide effective insurance, because only the state can write an insurance contract where it changed the terms ex post if the world moves. That's why we use uh, the state to do this in the case of health insurance and in a number of other areas. So the private sector won't do this. A possible alternative would, get, would be to get the state to do the whole lot. So if we turn to the next slide, we could have an NHS model for social care. So we could say, uh, social care will be provided free at the point of use to anybody who needs it in the UK. That's what we do in health. That will be feasible, but it, it simply isn't going to happen. The cost of that is such that the Treasury, uh, no, e e even a, a, a Treasury that was supportive of this simply isn't going to go with that, nor is there much political support. And it's also worth saying that when you talk to individuals about their social care needs, most of them recognise that it's not unreasonable that they should make some contribution towards their social care needs. They just don't want to be in the position where if they're one of those who have very high needs, they should pay for everything. So what should we do? Well, what we said nine years ago, and what I still believe to be the case now, if we go on to the next slide, is that on top of 
reforming and properly funding the means tested system for those who can't afford to look after themselves. We should use what Churchill described as the magic of averages to rescue the millions. We should put a social insurance structure in place which guarantees that if you're one of those who needs very high levels of social care then the state will step in. The cap that we described in 2010 is effect 2011 is effectively the excess in a social insurance policy. So the community as a whole would guarantee that it would work together so that any member of the community who had high social care needs would be looked after by us all. Only by doing this can we not only take away the fear and difficulty that faces individual consumers of social care, but also do something to make the sector viable. While we continue with a world where buying social care is like being in a shop with no prices, because although you know how much you'll have to spend per week or month for your or your parent or grandparent's social care, since you don't know how many weeks or months that will go on for, you just don't know what the aggregate price will be. Until we stop that, almost all consumers will want to buy the cheapest product that they possibly can that meets the regulatory requirements. And that means we'll be in a sector where it's very difficult to innovate, very difficult to invest, where the pressures to maintain wages at the lowest possible level continue. So we need to do this, we need to do it now. It seems to me that a fair measure of the strength of a society is how well in areas where only collective action can work, it manages to succeed in doing that. And I'm afraid that at the moment, social care is an area where we don't manage to do that well. This is an area that relies on us all working together, and yet people are left to their own resources. There is a means-tested system that protects those with the greatest needs, but the rest of the population, despite the desperate need to pull risk, is not able to do that. This requires state action. The Prime Minister on the day he became Prime Minister said that he had a plan to sort this out. Since then, there has been considerable amount of work, I'm, I'm sure, going on within government. And the Prime Minister, in his conference speech, used the phrase which I used earlier, that he wanted to solve this by a scheme which brought the magic of averages to the rescue of the millions. That is a phrase that was first used by Winston Churchill in the early part of the last century when he brought in a system of social insurance. Churchill returned to that phrase in 1943 when talking about the creation of the welfare state in the aftermath of the Second World War to which he was looking forward. And Churchill said that he, he should be counted along with his colleagues as an absolute supporter of a system of social insurance, which was already, he said, incomparable in the UK, but which he hoped in the post-war period would provide insurance for all classes of people against every risk from the cradle to the grave. In the UK in the post-war period, we've done a pretty good job in most areas of the welfare state. We haven't yet done that job in social care. It's absolutely critical that we do. It's clear that the Prime Minister understands the principles behind social insurance. He wouldn't have used that phrase in his conference speech this autumn if he didn't. Now the struggle must be working across the whole sector and with the media and with public servants and politicians to make sure that the argument can be won, I'd hope in time for the spring budget, to get this done once and for all. Until we have done that, we have a system of collective provision to cover risks that misses out, a critical risk that all of us face, and we really must get round to dealing with it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, that was a, a great start to this session, and I'm sure I can see already that good, the questions are coming through for you afterwards. Um, but let's now, if I may, move on and hear from our second speaker. Um, so welcome to James Bullion, who is the president of ADAS, the Association of, of Directors of Adult Social Care, um, who will be talking to us today um, about the impacts of COVID. 
and um, how it's shone a stark light on our care crisis. James, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Deborah, and thanks to you, Andrew, as well, for setting the scene so well in that presentation. If we could move on to the first slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, that stressed state that uh, social care finds itself in, and also about um, the prospects for reform and a little bit about what the elements should be. Um, as it says there, I'm, I'm a director in Norfolk, is my day job, and I'm elected as the president for ADAS uh, this year. Ne over to the next slide. Um, so just to summarise the challenges, very much echoing what Andrew has said, we, uh, we have suffered now for four to five years of very short-term time-limited funding um, elements, I would put it, that have meant that we haven't been able to plan long-term and we've not been able to really m move the strategy on a local level because of this national uh, inertia. Um, that's led us to some very fragile care markets across uh, England um, and um, the increasing demographic uh, pressures, which are a sign of success, are playing themselves out very unevenly across our country. Um, we have around about one and a half million people who don't get any help at all when they need some, but the nature of the means test doesn't bring them in. And um, we really aren't in a place where we can invest in prevention um, compared, for example, with the NHS, who have a long term plan with some dedicated resources that, that will bring a return in sustainability going forwards. Um, and then finally, we've got the challenge of the workforce, um, which which is um, beset with uh, turnover and uh, recruitment issues. So moving on. Um, of course, behind all of this are the people. And I just wanted to begin, you'd expect me as a serving social services director to say this, but of course we have the issue um, this year in particular of, of very sadly the deaths. We have the disruption that uh, has been wrought through uh, COVID with closures of services. And we have the working lives that have um, contained lots of bravery and heroic responses, but also sadly very, very poor outcomes like sickness and death. Um, and the trade-off that people have to make every day about um, their choices on discharge or, or, or whether or not to, uh, as it were, protect and safeguard versus uh, take control of their lives and their human rights. So um, th there are people behind all of what uh, both Andrew and I are, are talking about. Um, and um, moving on to, um, as it were, make a technical point uh, here. Every year ADAS surveys its members as to what, how are we feeling? What is our, what is our estimation of the year ahead? And uh, we, we started 2020 with most directors saying that they've got at least partial confidence that they can keep to their statutory duties. Um, and um, uh, it, it, now we face a situation where most directors uh, are feeling at best partial, but many, many are feeling they've got no confidence in their statutory duties going forwards, which I think for our country, uh, for our uh, Western countries, it's extraordinary for a statutory director to be saying, actually, we, I fear I may break the law going forwards because of the position uh, that we're in. So I wanted you to clock that as a technical point that that's what directors are saying. Uh, moving on, we, we um, have a real uh, issue and problem with our care markets. Uh, mo most directors are now reporting closures, um, handbacks in the jargon, so suppliers who are unable to carry on and need to hand the care back to the council to reorganize many people um, impacted every year and and the consequences of of covid will play out next year in the care market in cash flow terms for the time being we have protected the situation in local councils as best we can using national support but we do have an unresolved um uh, scenario that will play itself out next year if we don't take uh, action um, and then moving on, just for a further contextual point about the workforce. So this is 1.6 million people, as many uh, people that work uh, in the NHS, if not more. And it's uh, projected to grow by half a million. So we need practically every school leader to work in social care going forwards, which, which doesn't seem very likely based on the model that we've got. Um, and the turnover in social care is extraordinarily high. Would, would, why, do, as a society, do we find that acceptable? 
uh, actually, and we, we have a great deal of vacancies. So social care is, is bigger, uh, and I like saying this, it's bigger than tourism. We are bigger than agriculture. We are bigger, certainly, than fishing, uh, which is somewhat top of the agenda at the moment. So this is an economic growth uh, argument that we are making in social care, as well as a personal needs argument, as well as a moral uh, argument. So uh, just moving on to uh, the reform issues. So ADAS published in uh, uh, the June this year, July this year, uh, nine statements about what we think reform should be about. So we, we are, um, uh, to coin a phrase, oven ready with our proposals to government uh, if the financial question that Andrew so well uh, illustrated can, can be solved. Uh, and then moving on to the next slide, the elements of this for us, firstly, are about a public conversation, not a long one. We don't want a, a, an elongated process. But when you think about what society knows about the NHS or the army or the police, what it knows about social care is really quite limited and shaped by misapprehension and misunderstanding. Um, and we, we've been working with others on, on what the vision should be, very simplistically, about supporting people in a place where they can live well and where their community cares for them and a universal vision. Um, secondly, the integration with the NHS is crucial, but really it's elements of integration, particularly around the short term care and the responsiveness for people who are in crises. But really a long term solution in the NHS for social care would probably not give people enough choice, freedom and control. Um, and, and quite apart from the affordability issue, would probably have a centralising effect, although the NHS is very much in a place-based lo local way of working uh, at the moment. And then um, the, our care markets, not quite apart from the fragility, we do need to ask ourselves how much consumer protection is there for people to devote their own resources to this situation today? What are your rights in a care home, for example, what are, your, what are your rights, as it were, for getting your own value for money and who really is protecting that? Um, arguably, councils need to do more in that, in that arena. And then finally, the issue on this slide of inequalities. COVID has really shone a, a sharp uh, light on the discrimination, the underlying discrimination that social work tries to reverse. Uh, and I would point to both age discrimination in the way that social care is, is organised and funded and disability exclusion in the way that uh, certain groups have less uh, rights in how reform uh, will get done. And then uh, finally, on, on, on the next slide, um, we, we, we need to acknowledge that housing is a crucial part both of the funding equation that Andrew was talking about, the trillions of pounds that is tied up in people's own homes and capital, but also housing is not capable of caring for that growing population. The ceilings aren't strong enough. The technology isn't in the home. There are 400,000 uh, shortfall of, of uh, homes, extra care homes, for example, in the country. We, we do need a workforce strategy. We, we can't rely um, uncharitably on, a, on what I might call a treasury view of unemployment solving the problem of social care. We need a vocational strategy for those people to come work in social care from, from all over Europe. Um, we, we must get to grips with the opportunity of, of technology. And this isn't just about the Department of Health and Social Care. I, I feel um, getting close nationally to the conversations. We have a Department of Health responsible for the policy, a Ministry of Housing responsible for the, for the delivery and other government departments facing the other way about economics or about planning or about uh, some of the wider societal um, influences that must be brought to bear on, on the change we need. It's not just about money. I did end on money rather than begin with it. But as Andrew has so well illustrated, we need just as a society to invest in this approach solve the question uh, that is in the political manifestos about whether you sell your house and whether you pull the risk. But fundamentally, this is about an investment approach. Um, if we don't do that, there will be costs. So it's not about um, going forwards or not. It's about going backwards or going forwards. Thank you. Brilliant. James, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, two 
very interesting um, perspectives there and, and, and lots to discuss and for certain the questions are coming in. But before I go to the questions, just a reminder, if you haven't answered the poll, please do. Um, it, it's on the right of your screens. Um, but, but let's go straight away. We have about 10 minutes, I think, for questions. Um, let me find my way to those. So um, let's start uh, from the beginning, if I may. So um, the first question, um, uh, well, two interlinked questions, perhaps. So the first for, for, for Sir Andrew. So from um, uh, Judge Bushell, the care cap you suggested constantly gets a lot of coverage, but the accommodation cap you suggested doesn't seem to be mentioned as much. Do you believe the government is aware of the vital need to address accommodations costs as well as direct care costs? And um, perhaps the second one um, from Stephen Lowe is, uh, thanks to you, Andrew, for your presentation. And do you think that there is a credible alternative? If not, is it inevitable your approach will be implemented when we have the political courage? So two questions there for you, Andrew. Um, thank you. So, so the, the first about um, how you would implement a care cap and the, the very important role of accommodation costs in all of this. Um, I think the government is aware of, of the important thinking clearly about this, certainly officials in the Department of Health and Social Care who, who went through all of this as they took it through legislative scrutiny for, for um, legislation that actually passed in 2014 due for implementation in 2016. I think um, people often ask me, well, how, have you changed your mind since 2011? That's, a, that's always a challenging thing. And I think one thing that I have probably shifted my view on a bit is the uh, the central assumption we made in 2011 was that the amount that would be deemed to be accommodation costs and therefore people would be responsible for, even under the cap, I think we thought it should be a figure of around £10,000 a year. I think if I were pressed on that now, I'd suggest a, a rather lower figure of, a, of around £8,000, which is covered by the individual's pension entitlement, because I think that's important. But to, uh, let, let me not get too much into the detail, but yesterday I think I think uh, officials are very alert to that. Do I think there's a credible alternative? Um, I think there are credible complements. So, so I think there are credible things that, that need to be done alongside this. So this really goes to some of what, what James said. It's not just funding reform that we need. We need a, a wholesale system reform. We need workforce reform. We need eligibility and assessment reform. We need technological transformation. But I do think that funding reform is an absolute essential prerequisite. We can't do the other things unless we've got funding reform. I don't think that there's a better way of thinking about it than thinking about this, where this curve is and how we deal with people at different points in it. I think there are, there are plausible differences of view about where the cap should be. So if you wanted to take a universalist position, you'd say the cap should be zero. Um, that would be the equivalent. The, the NHS is a is, is social insurance with a cap of zero for healthcare. Um, so I think the, the more concerned you are about tax, the higher you're likely to think the cap should be set at, and the more concerned you are about uniform, uh, universal provision, the lower you want, you want to set the cap at. So I think this is probably the right way to think about it, although of course I would say that, wouldn't I? Do I think it's inevitable that it will be implemented I suppose I think if a reform is implemented, it, it probably will have shared these characteristics, but I don't think it's, in, it's inevitable that we will get a reform. I think it's incredibly important and desirable that we should, but I think we all have to take responsibility for continuing to make noise about this. Uh, as James said, there's been a lot of attention, or perhaps it was Deborah or both, there's been a lot of attention given to social care. But so far, you know, despite the enormous amount of attention and the very significant challenges that social care has faced in the last nine months, it would be hard to characterise the outcome in the spending review as a huge increase in funding for social care. The spending review, despite all of this attention coming through on social care, didn't provide a long-term funding solution. So I think we still really need to make the case for the importance of this, uh, the way in which 
people can have a really high quality of life if they're cared for properly and not if they're not. We, we've really still got to keep banging, banging the drum, otherwise there's a risk that we won't get change. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, just we'll hopefully you have a chance to come back to that because I think those messages are, are very important here and it would be good to hear both your views. But I just wanted to pick up on other aspects um, of the, the need for social care form highlighted by um, James. So there were some questions coming in here. Um, James, such an important point about investing in the vocational strategy of care. How does the carer profession become a profession which offers career progression and has an attractive pay package? Asks Alison Benzimra. Um, and uh, yeah, somebody else, Lily Parsi, also asking, how do we make social care careers more attractive? Perhaps the answer is in Alison's question. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a really challenging question, given the distributed nature of the care sector, you know, over 18,000 uh, different employers. Um, so you have to have something quite strong that sits atop that, that would link uh, care workers into a pattern of training and development that might lead to other careers. You think about it, a care worker could end up running a care business uh, or could end up a nurse or could end up uh, managing a, a service. So. So actually there's great scope. Um, I, I think the figure is that NHS training uh, is about 4,000 a year and uh, skills for care, levels of training for care workers is, is about 140. So you've got a massive scope for in, uh, having a, a wraparound uh, scares approach, uh, cares uh, skills approach, which would really attract people into, into the profession. There's something though that society has to do, which is to change our picture of of care being low skilled uh, into being very skilled. And there's there's a point about value here and valuing that those particular interventions in a way that we just haven't got to grips with because the image uh, is wrong. So it's, a, it's about image as well as uh, practical things like training and support. Mm. Thank, thank you for that, James. And, and I guess kind of uh, wanted to ask you both really. So um, when we assess the impact of any reforms on the people who use care services, if and when that finally happens, do you both have any thoughts on how we might more consistently look at the outcomes for people with support needs? Can I start off on that one? Please, yeah. Deborah, thank you. So um, it's a really good question. And we do we do need to shift from a, a position of measuring hours of care uh, into what's the outcome we're trying to achieve. With our short-term care goals, we're reasonably good at this now. If we look at things like reablement or rehabilitation that uh, we work with on the NHS, we pay for an episode of care that ends in somebody achieving a goal and we we calculate it in that way and we're able to um, fund it that way but mainly because it's free and and the individuals know as it were that they don't have to pay for an outcome that's potentially uncertain so I do I do think the key is about people defining their own outcomes as part of the process of of working with care providers but also us being very clear about the charging side of that so that we you know, so that we can translate whatever it is we're trying to achieve with people into something that looks reasonable for them to contribute towards. But we, we certainly can give people much more control of personal budgets and personal health budgets and all those good, really good Fundamental Care Act legislation that was introduced in 2014. It's brilliant stuff. It's just been introduced at a time of declining resources. I think if we were in a different financial scenario, it would be playing out differently. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, you I, agree, I agree with all of that. I think the only thing I'd add is I think we really should be should be measuring and reporting outcomes a lot. Uh, one of the many uh, ways in which those who haven't had much direct contact with social care misunderstand is that there's a there's it's easy to fall into the assumption that anybody who needs social care support is having a really miserable life with low life satisfaction. Um, no sense of put and and the reverse can be true um yeah. and so measuring outcomes to make sure that we are doing the very best to ensure that those who need social care are having uh, good lives which in many many cases they are and then reporting that so that we move away from this terrible but widespread misapprehension that 
social care is just a waiting room for the end mm. and a waiting room. And it isn't that. And it can be a really flourishing part of our lives. And we need to help people to understand that. One way we can do that is by measuring, but also reporting on outcomes. Thank you. And that presumably should be the whole purpose of the forum to ensure that it is absolutely that, enabling people to live the lives that they choose to live rather than having to live less satisfactory. And Absolutely. It is that, but it's also about stopping us all being frightened. I agree. Yeah. So at the moment, so, there's a fear of social care, despite the fact that most of us won't need a very long period of social care. And because there's no way of managing it, many people who won't end up needing it are very frightened and constrained and upset by it. So we, in just the same way, we, we have a car insurance system and the beneficiaries of car insurance are not just the people who have crashes. They're mm -hmm. us knowing that when we get into the car in the morning or when we leave our, our house in the morning, if it burns down, if it crashes, it's the, we're not faced by disaster. So we're not talking just about the relatively small group who are receiving social care at any moment. It's, it's about making all of us feel comfortable about our futures. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have for questions, which is such a shame because there, there are more coming through and lots more to discuss. Um, however, I'm mindful that we asked a polling question at the beginning. Um, so I wonder if we could have the results of that on our screens. Um, and whilst we're waiting for that, just to say a huge thank you to everybody who's kind of tuned in for this session and to both of our speakers, to James Bullion and Andrew Dilnett. I think that's been fantastic. Um, uh, let's see if the poll comes up. That will be fantastic. I do. Okay. You can see the poll now. Fantastic. Okay, fine. Well, I now have access to that. So here we go, if you can't see it on your screen. So um, more confident, are you more or less confident than a year ago that the government has a plan to address the care, confident, care crisis? Um, more confident, 3.3%, less confident, 71.7%, and the same 25%. Um, that, that, that gives a, quite a stark message, I guess. Uh, and so I guess just in summary, um, uh, you know, some really interesting and thought provoking presentations this afternoon. And thank you again to both our speakers. But what seems clear is that whatever reform solution is finally agreed upon, it will have to have at least three components. First, we will have to spend more on social care. You cannot get high quality accessible care on the cheap. Second, we won't see any improvement to quality without tackling the issues in the workforce. That means improving pay certainly, but it also means shaping social care to be a desirable career with clear opportunities for progression. And third, whatever reform is pursued in the UK will always need to come back to think about its impact. Fixing social care has become such a cliched and divisive question. Um, it sometimes seems, doesn't it, to exist just as a wonky policy problem with little connection to people's lives. But social care is not at root simply a political conundrum to solve. It is about the means by which people as Andrew and James were talking about, with care needs of all ages, can be enabled to live the lives that they choose with dignity and purpose. So when we're thinking about the success of any attempts at reform, we must go back to that question of the difference it has made to the lives of people who actually use these services, and they must be fully involved and at the heart of the decisions that are made. Many thanks for joining this afternoon and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.